is, this is the, I, I think, people always say like, oh, this is the low time of the day. This is the best time of the day. This is the best time of the day to take a nap. It is the best time of the day to go for a run. It is the best time of the day to drink some nitro-infused coffee. Have you guys been to this place? It's nearby. Apparently, they have, they, they have three missions. Their first mission is to love people. Their second mission is to be part, build up community. And the third part, their third part of their mission is coffee. So I, I'm doing the third part right now. I don't know. Atticus Finch, I think it's called. Um, you guys, hey, uh, y'all know what this, this talk is about? What you don't know it's about? Elevate your mind. It's about porn. We're going to talk about porn. You guys want to talk about porn? That's what we're talking about. That's what it's about. We're talking about porn. So uh, I, since we're going to talk about porn, I think it's an important thing, uh, important to gather with a spirit of prayer. And so if you have a cap, could you please decapitate in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit? Father in heaven, we give you praise and glory. We thank you so much for bringing us to this place. We thank you for giving us our own bodies and thank you for giving us um, our souls that can, and our minds that can, that can discover the meaning of the body and the beauty and the goodness and the dignity of the body. Help us to see our own bodies um, with that same dignity and that same beauty and that same goodness. Help us to see each other's bodies with that same dignity and that same beauty and that same goodness. Lord, help us not to reject the body, but to embrace it, but to embrace it as you have taught us and revealed to us how to embrace the body. Make this prayer, not only in the mighty name of Jesus, but also through the intercession of Our Lady as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, so honestly, this is actually going to be a pretty relatively uh, se- serious, relatively deep uh, conversation. But in this, and when I say conversation, I mean one-way conversation. Um, but, but in this, I think one of the things that we can start hearing about this topic, and we can be all like, oh, okay, what are they going to say? And what's he going to say? What am I supposed to do? There can be a lot of things involving shame and a lot of things involving condemnation when you start talking about stuff like porn. And so one of the first things I just want to invite everyone to re- realize is, please, this is, these are the words of Jesus. These are the words of, of St. John Paul the Great. When he, when he became Pope, he stepped out onto the uh, balcony at St. Peter's Square, and he just said, do not be afraid. So as we dive deeply into this, we're going to talk about serious stuff this afternoon. And it's actually serious stuff that probably involves you. Likely, just chances are, we're t- the stuff we're going to talk about is not about, like, I can imagine, like, someone's like, yeah, in v- porn, yeah, uh, they need to hear about this, and the person next to me. Like, you no, know, probably you need to hear about it. Why? Because everyone is affected. Every single one of us is affected because we lived in what we call a pornographied culture. Um, nine out of ten boys are exposed to porn, serious porn, by the age, before the age of 18. It's actually over nine it's like 90 plus percent. Um, six out of 10 girls are exposed to pretty hardcore porn before the age of 18. And the first exposure for boys is before the age 12. In fact, um, I think the average age is around seven or eight years old. Now, I, I would say like, whoa, those people, that's crazy. That's right now. But I can remember my first exposure to pornography, same kind of thing. I was roughly, I think I was eight and then one of those crazy things, you probably experienced this as well, where I can remember what the exact image looked like. It gets stuck in there. You're like, why is this there? I don't want it to be there. It's there, but it's there. I didn't go looking for it. I didn't try, try to find it. But I remember when I saw it. And this could be your experience too. You didn't go looking for it, but it found you. And this one of the things is, again, everyone is affected. First exposure for boys before the age 12, most, most of them by the age of eight. of boys and 57% of girls have seen group sex online. Now these are, again, children. Children have seen this. Almost 85% and almost 60% of boys and girls have seen this. So this is very common, right? Everyone's affected. But but it's influenced us, right? So here's another stat. 67% of young men and almost 50% of young women say that viewing porn is an acceptable way to express one's sexuality. 
So not only have we seen this, we've been affected by this. And not like those people out there, us in here, have been affected by this, where we might even think, no, it's not even, not, not only is it not harmful, but actually is potentially helpful. That's what they're saying. Is this potentially helpful? Almost 70% of young men and almost 20% of young women use porn at least once a week. Again, this, is changes. This, this, this changes how we look at ourselves. This changes how we look at other people. This is just, it, it's remarkable because everyone's affected. So much so, why is everyone affected? Because it makes money. $13 billion a year in the United States alone. That's billion with a B. I don't know if you caught that on there. $13 billion a year in the U.S., Go to the porn industry. Now, I know people, they'll say things like, well, the porn, I don't, I don't, I don't pay that. I don't contribute. I don't, the only porn I look at is free porn. I'll tell you that right now. Like, no, no, no. Because all the ads and all the other kind of like pop-ups and all those other kind of things, they contribute to that $13 billion a year. It, worldwide, it's astronomical. Um, the little note here about pay-per-view, I think that's really funny. Like pay-per-view, uh, you know, boxing, pay-per-view, um, other kind of movies, 70 plus percent of pay-per-view is porn. The why, why is it so everywhere? Because it makes money. Why is it everywhere? Because it changes how we see ourselves, changes how we see other people, and it actually can change how we live. And everyone, everyone is affected. So again, you might be a chaperone here and be like, yeah, those young people, they need to hear about that porn thing. It's not a young person's issue. And you, the ladies might be thinking like, well, yeah, but I mean, those guys need to hear about it. Listen, ladies, you know this, you know this as well as I do. This is not just a guy's issue. This is both for guys and for girls because both men and women are affected by this all of the time, every single day. And you don't need me to tell you, but I think sometimes we don't say it. And you don't need to hear just from me. There's a the friend of mine, we recorded her, and she would give her own testimony about her experience um, with her involvement in pornography. Hi there, my name is Cecilia War, and I am a beloved daughter of God. Why do I start there? I start there because in our society, it's really easy to identify ourselves with the things that we like or the things that we dislike or the things that we struggle with. So for example, I could say, hi, I'm Cecilia War, and I am a shopper. I love to shop. Or I'm a reader. I love to read. But really, that's not my inherent identity. My fundamental identity is as a child of God. And as a child of God, I struggled with pornography and masturbation for 10 long years. It started when I was nine years old and a friend of mine and I stumbled upon pornography um, when we were over at our house for a play date. We did not plan on this happening, um, but that day started a very shameful secret struggle. And neither one of us really had the vocabulary to deal with what we were experiencing. We didn't know the word pornography. We didn't know the word masturbation. Um, and so this really um, entrapped us and we didn't have the tools to break free. And I went to youth group um, some years later and once a year the boys got taken off for their version of the chastity talk and we, the women, got taken off to our version of the chastity talk. Um, and the guys would hear about pornography um, and the ways to break free if that was something they struggled with or just things to look out for. Um, and the women, we talk about relationships. And so as a young girl, I'm thinking, well, I'm not in a relationship with anyone and I'm the only girl in the world who's struggling with this and I can't tell anyone. And so this really continued that shame and that secrecy um, until I was about 17 years old and I took a leap of courage and I didn't want to be entrapped by this anymore. And so I went to confession um, and I was expecting the priest to look at me when I said the word pornography and say, get out. You are not loved. You are not forgiven. And you are the only girl who's ever done this before. But instead, the priest looked at me with love and said, I am so proud of you. And I'm so sorry for what you've gone through. And Jesus loves you and he forgives you and you are made clean. And as he said those words of absolution, I was made clean. And I wish I could tell you that that was the last time I ever looked at pornography and I was healed that day. And it's just as easy as that. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. It continued to be a struggle. But there were some things that I did that really helped me in my fight for freedom. 
Um, so the first thing was I became a reconciliation-aholic. And I tried as hard as I could within 24 hours of falling to getting myself in front of a priest in confession. Um, and I found that when I went that quickly, it made it a lot harder to justify falling to the sin of pornography or masturbation again. The second thing that I did was I got myself in front of our Lord in the Eucharist as often as possible. So that was daily mass as often as I could make it. Um, and also getting in front of the Lord in the blessed sacrament in perpetual adoration. Um, that priest shared with me that when we are trying to free ourselves from a visual sin like pornography, um, we have to retrain our eyes. We have to give ourselves good images. And so sitting in front of my Lord and having that be the image in my head um, really helped me to keep command of my thoughts and not just command of my actions. The other thing that I did is I started a day counter on my phone. Um, and so I would, every time I fell, I'd have to set it back to zero. Um, and after a while, it got really hard to set it back to zero when I'd been doing really well. Um, and so it became a, I'm not going to be, I don't have to do this forever, but I just have to make it one more day. I've made it two days. I can make it three. Okay. I've made it a week. I can make it two weeks. And pretty soon that day counter got so large that I didn't want to set it back to zero. Um, and so today it's been 1,465 days since the last time I confessed the sin of pornography. Um, the Victory app, which I didn't have when I was your age, um, has this feature built in. And so I strongly encourage the Victory app um, to help you on your road to freedom. And I just want to tell you, as your sister in Christ, that freedom is so possible, that you are a beloved child of God, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he wants to make you clean, and he's going to help you do it. My name is Cecilia War, and I am a beloved child of God, and so are you. Awesome. It's so good. And it's, it can be so good, so good to hear from, from someone who, um, who lives in this culture and at the same time says, actually, I've experienced freedom. Because as we know, porn is everywhere. It's on mainstream TV where you have actual TV series like Game of Thrones, which is basically porn with more of a plot behind it. Um, you have music videos that have pornography in them. Magazines are actually completely... I remember going to a talk by um, an artist. This artist was talking about the goodness... As, a, as an artist, what he would do oftentimes is he would paint... Um, nude forms because that's part of art and he was making a distinction I'll make this distinction later on as well making a distinction between how we look at images that are simply the human body and its beauty and pornography and he was pointing out how even simply covers of magazines where someone has clothes on, clothes on, he says, that's, that's porn. And I'm going to explain why that's porn in just a second. But they're in magazines. We have awards. Actually, so much so, porn is now in our culture so fully that we even have um, different kinds of things we associate with porn. For example, um, there's food porn, right? You have Instagram uh, accounts that are just all food porn. They have pictures of delicious-looking food, and we call that porn with regard to food. You have car porn. You really like cars, and here's these awesome-looking cars, but you, the fact that you like them is called car porn. You have word porn, because I love words so much that, like, to indulge in the sounds or the use of words, you call it word porn. It doesn't make any sense at all. Sunset porn, I just made that one up. But, like, the idea... Or people who like really like cabins, like on the lake, and you have all these images of, there's, again, there's channels where you can look up cabin porn, and it is not what you might think. It's just pictures of cabins next to lakes in mountains, like, wow, that's awesome. But because you like it, you call it porn. Think, see how vacation porn, gun porn, organization porn, if you're like kind of a little bit OCD, like you, you like to say, oh, I love those cabinets. Those cabinets and those boxes are so awesome. I like them so much, I'm going to call it porn. Because why? Because porn is everywhere, and it's infiltrated so that if you like something, We'll just reference it as porn. So the question remains, like, well, what is porn? Um, actually, the word pornography, interestingly enough, it means, if you break it down, it means wicked writing. That's what porn means. It means wicked writing. Perverse writing, wicked writing. Now, is, is, is porn simply the depiction of the human body? No, because as... Catholic Christians, what we believe is we believe the human body is good. We believe your body is good. 
that other people's bodies are good. And there is, as I mentioned before, a massive difference between art that depicts the human body and pornography. In fact, um, maybe some of you have heard of this before, but uh, in the Sistine Chapel, when, when Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, there are, if you've ever been there, all over the ceiling and on the sides of the walls, there are naked people. And think about this. This is in a church. <laughs> you go into the church to see, like, naked, naked person, naked person, naked person. But it's not porn. It's art, and it's beautiful. Why? And this is where the artist revealed this. He said, he, he gave us two images. I don't have the images, but he showed two images. One was the image of, a, it was a painting of a woman, and she was at this basin. She's washing something in the basin. And he said, just look at this. Look what your, what your, what your eye does when you see this image. The image starts, you look at the woman's face, then you would follow her arms as she was holding this basin, and you see her whole body, her whole self, and you go back to her face. And as you're looking at it, you look at the whole person, and you look at the whole person again, and the whole person again. He says, that's art. But then he showed a picture, it was, a, it was the cover of Cosmo. And the, the woman on the cover of Cosmo um, had clothing on, but he said, look at the image itself. Where do your eyes go? And went from the woman's eyes, which were not just simply like pleasantly looking at you, but they're what you call do me eyes. You all know do me eyes, right? Eyes that say do me. You all know what do me eyes are. So eyes that say do me. And then, because why? Because what's being revealed by the photographer is, hey, model, we want everyone who looks at you to feel like you want to have sex with them. So give us the best do me eyes. Your, guys, your eyes go to her eyes, and then just followed her lines of her body to certain parts of her body. Now here's the, here's the interesting thing. A person doesn't have to be naked for it to be pornography. Why, what's pornography? Pornography is any depiction of the human person or the sexual act in a way that is meant to incite lust. Any depiction of the human person or the sexual act that's meant to incite lust. That's why if you go into the, into the Sistine Chapel and look at the, ba the naked pictures, you're not like, whoa. <laughs> you're like, oh, okay, naked person. Kind of weird, but actually I have, I have a picture of, of one of the panels of the Sistine Chapel over my uh, kitchen table. At the New I work at a Newman Center at the Newman House, and whenever I'm meeting with people, they're all, sometimes they're like, I always forget that there's naked people on my wall. And they're like, okay, why is he, the priest have like naked people on his wall? I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I forgot about that. Well, here's what it does. We believe the human body is good. Pornography is any depiction of the human person, human body, or the sexual act in a way that's meant to incite lust. It's meant to not have you go just simply Wow, beautiful, but it's meant, you to, it's meant to make you want to lust. Therefore, someone says, like, um, well, they, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, they have, they have clothes on, but every one of those pictures is meant to make you want to lust. Another way to ask, or to say, like, how do you assess whether something's pornography or not, another way to describe it is, any depiction of the human person that reduces the human person to human parts. Any depiction of the human person that reduces the human person to human parts. That's why that artist pointed out, he said, no, look at that image of that woman, you look at her whole self. Or look at the image of this man, you look at his whole self. David, by Michelangelo. He is naked in David. He's naked David. That is art, not porn. Why? Because it doesn't reduce the human person to human parts. It's you look at this and see there is the human person depicted in art. Not meant to incite lust, but simply meant to reveal beauty. Hugely different than like what they used to have in the back in the day, like Playboy or Playgirl magazine. Meant to reveal beauty more than anything else. And this is such a hugely important, because why? Because in the, mo in the midst of this, we can actually get a little discouraged. In the midst of this, like, it's like, wait, you don't even have to be naked in order for it to be porn? No, it doesn't. Anything that was meant to incite lust can, can be considered pornography. And then at this point, you start going like, wait a second, wait a second. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting out of here because I'm feeling a little bit condemned. Well, here's where St. Paul speaks to all of us. 
especially if you're someone who thinks like, no way, I could never admit this to anyone that I experienced this or I struggle with this because St. Paul says there is no temptation that has come against you that is not common to man. You're not the only one, St. Paul is basically saying. There's no temptation that's come against you that other people, that all people have not encountered or experienced. And here's actually a word of hope. Because, again, we live in such a, what do you call, pornographied culture that we just think this is normal. We think this is natural. We think this is every, it is everywhere. It's in your pocket for crying out loud. I remember hearing a person point this out and said, he said, um, think of the saints that you love. Think of, think of the saints who are incredibly heroic that you look up to. Maybe even like someone like St. Augustine. St. Augustine's often known for overcoming his, his, his uh, his broken sexuality. And this person pointed out and said, none of those saints had to fight the battle that every person in our culture has to fight. Because none of those saints had access to porn in their pocket. None of those saints had access to porn every single day when parents were out of the house or everyone went to sleep. None of them had to fight the battle that every person in this auditorium has to fight on a daily basis. They didn't have to fight this battle. But at the same time, there's no temptation that has come against you that isn't common to man. What has God given us? But God is faithful, and he will not let you be tried beyond your strength. In fact, with the trial, he'll also provide a way out. So you, so you will be able to bear it. But at the same time, this is true, and this is, should be a le level of encouragement, but at the same time, what we need to do is we need to actually look at what porn does to us. I'm going to point out three things porn does to every single person who kind of gives themselves over to porn. The first thing porn does, it porn makes you stupid. It's true. Porn, and that, porn makes you stupid. This is, just, this is actually science. This is, this is, this is a, a scientific fact. In fact, um, researchers have found that even moderate porn use is correlated with shrunken gray matter in parts of the brain that oversee cognitive function. Not like someone who's like on, on, their, on their computer like for 13 hours a day looking at porn. Moderate porn use can shrink your brain, shrink your gray matter in your brain that's correlated with what? Cognitive function. In fact, even more, even moderate porn use, porn use is correlated with da brain damage. Moderate porn use correlated scientifically Neuroscience says it correlated with brain damage of parts of the brain involved with motivation and decision-making. So think about this. The next time someone says, like, ah, I just can't find the motivation to get out of bed in the morning. Oh, really? <laughs> Maybe you have that friend who, who really poor uh, about this, making bad decisions a lot. Like, tell me about your porn use. I'm concerned with the brain damage it's causing you. In fact, there was a study that uh, in Belgium, looking at 14-year-old boys, that they looked at their academic performance twice and compared the two scores. They found that, quote, an increased use of internet pornography decreased the boys' academic performance the la in six months later. Porn, literally, scientifically, porn makes you dumb. It causes brain damage. So, it, so when someone says, it's harmless, no, it actually makes you stupid. Also, it makes you a slave. Again, this is, this is neuroscience. Porn makes you a slave. Why? Because every time someone looks at porn, it gives a shot of dopamine, which is a naturally occurring hormone in the body. And it goes to the brain's reward center. But over the course of time, with the dulled reward center, a person can't feel dopamine's effects as well as they did the first time. And as a result, the porn that they've been using can stop producing the same feeling of excitement and as a result, many go in search of more hardcore material to get a bigger dopamine burst. And they go back again and again and again. And the brain on porn acts in virtually the exact same way as the brain on cocaine, meth, and opioids. Now, to consider this, like, like some of you would say, I would, no, I would never do drugs like this. Why? Because I don't want to, listen, I'm in control of my own body. I'm in control of my own brain. And yet the brain on porn acts in the exact same way as brain on coke on meth, on opioids. And particularly those parts of the brain associated with frontal volitional control. Being able to make the kind of decisions you want to make. Again, what does that mean, frontal volitional control? What it means is being the person you want to be. Doing the things you want to actually do. Porn can actually make a person 
a slave to themselves and make themselves a person a slave to their feelings or emotions. It makes you stupid. Porn makes you a slave. And devastatingly, porn makes you an accomplice. Porn makes you an accomplice in the abuse of every person involved with porn. Now, I know that people say in this, they say, well, no, those people who are involved in pornography, they want to be there. Well, there's a woman, um, her name is Catherine McGinnis, and Catherine McGinnis is a social science researcher, and she says this quote. She says, as with all prostitution, because that's what porn is, porn is prostitution, paying people for sex. As with all prostitution, the women and children involved in pornography are in the main, not there because of choice, but because of a lack of choices. They're not there because they want to be, and they had all these things. You can be anything you want to be. What do you want to be? I want to be a porn star. No. There might be 0.01% of people in porn are there because they want to be. Not because of choice, because of lack of choices. In fact, she says, they usually consent, quote unquote, only in a degraded and demented sense of the word, in which a person who despairs at stopping what is happening sees no escape and no real, has no real alternative. Here's what describes most people in porn. They're often sexually abused before as a child. They're often addicted to drugs. They're often homeless, hopeless, and often, most often, trying to avoid being beaten or killed. And is almost always ac economically desperate and acquiesces or agrees to being sexually abused for payment even if, even if, in most circumstances, they're not the ones who get paid. Someone else gets paid. This describes most people you see in those images where everyone seems happy. It seems like they love it so much. Now, I'm going to give you some quotes right now just to kind of highlight the fact that porn makes a person an accomplice. And these quotes are from people who have been involved in porn themselves. And these quotes themselves are, are incredibly um, disturbing. But we have to kind of look at them right in the face. The first one is by a girl named Corinne. During a scene with a male porn star, I yelled at him to stop over and scream no over and over, but he wouldn't stop. The pain became too much and I was in shock and my body went limp and I couldn't fight him off anymore. After the scene, they wouldn't even give me a ride home. I called a taxi, went to a medical clinic to check me out due to the severe pain I was in. A day later, I received a phone call from the director to keep my mouth shut about the rape. He threatened me. I didn't know who I was messing with and that his edited footage of what had happened would prove me a liar. Now, not only had this happened by this guy, the, the, the male actor, but the cameraman, every other person in the room, were consenting to videotaping the rape of this woman who is begging this person to stop. And now it's on the internet, and anyone can watch it. It's just porn. No one's getting hurt. But she was begging this person to stop. Jesse J says, people in the porn industry are numb to real life. They're like zombies walking around. The abuse, she says, that goes on in this industry is completely ridiculous. The way these young ladies are treated is totally sick and brainwashing. I left due to the traumas I experienced, even though I was only there a short time. And there's this guy, he's, he owns this porn company. And he says, amateurs come across better on screen. Why? Our customers feel that, especially by women, you can see it, they still feel strong pain. That what sells, what sells is, oh, this is painful for this individual here. And that's what a video director or porn producer wants. Because that, what does that do? It gives a bigger shot of dopamine. We have to understand that every person you and I were to see in any kind of pornography scene is there not because of choice, is there because of lack of choices. And in any given scene, that could literally be a rape that we are simply viewing. Because porn makes you stupid, porn makes you a slave, and porn makes you an accomplice. Now, I, I, gave, this, uh, I gave this talk a couple weeks ago um, in Minnesota. And I got an email from one of the, the gals who left the, left the conference, and she said she got home, and she told her boyfriend about this. She said, she wrote to me, she said, my boyfriend and his best friend were laughing at me because I thought porn was, porn was wrong. My boyfriend and his best friend said that, no, they would never stop looking at porn because that's ridiculous and that I should just get used to it. What should I do? And I'm like, I, 
so for me, you guys, I have to tell you this. I was blown away. I thought, like, really, your boyfriend actually looked you in the face, and he told you that he looks at porn. Not only that, but he was not, he had no problem with it, and he said he was going to keep doing this. I just have to say, if you're dating someone, guy or girl, and they say, listen, yeah, look at porn, and it's not a big deal, please, have enough dignity and self-respect to break up with them right there. Because it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, what, what, would, what kind of sense would it make to say, <laughs> here's Jack dating Jane, and Jack looks at Jane and says, Jane, listen, I love you and I respect you. You have so much dignity. You're so beautiful. But here's what I want to do. I want to look at other women's naked bodies and think about having sex with them. And Jane says, aw, he's just my Romeo. Like, no! We need to actually wake up and say, no, there's some things that are really right. There's some things that are really wrong. This is something that's really wrong. Poor makes you stupid, poor makes you a slave, and poor makes you an accomplice. But you might be in a different place. We all might be in a different place here. We might be in a place today where we're saying, like, I know that stuff. I don't need you to just make me feel bad. I need you to give me a way out, and I want to give you guys a way out. Because probably everyone in this room, you're probably th saying, again, like, I know it's wrong, but I want help. Is there hope for me? And the answer is absolutely yes. If this is part of your experience, it's part of your life, I want to offer to you all, all, a way out. And one of the ways out is to understand what gets us in. One of the ways out is to understand what gets us in. There's this, this doctor, he's a social scientist. His name is, um, what is his name? His name is Kevin Skinner. Kevin Skinner talks about the superhighway. And he says that when someone has an addictive behavior, particularly an addictive behavior to porn, to masturbation, they get on the superhighway. And it follows seven steps. First step is the trigger or the stimulus. That kind of thing is like, um, you know, the, the, the thing that leads you to think about porn, whatever that is. Maybe it's uh, watching a commercial. Maybe it's a particular TV channel. Maybe it's a time of day. Maybe it's being home by yourself. Another way, to think, another way to think of it is, what are the people, places, and things that kind of trigger me to think about maybe porn? What are my triggers? That's the first step. Second step is the emotion. So first, here's the trigger. Okay, it's the afternoon, and no one else is home. There's the computer. Trigger. Then there's the emotion. And that emotion can be like a rush of excitement. It can be the sense of curiosity, like, oh, wow, what might I find? Trigger. There's the emotion. Then there's the thought, and actually the thought is the, uh, I wonder what I'd find if I looked. The thought is, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just check my email quick. I talk, you guys, I work on a college campus, and so, and we have confession every day, and so I have a conversation with a lot of the men and women on my campus about this a lot. And just kind of walking with them about like, what's the pattern? When you get on the superhighway, there was the trigger, there was the emotion, there was the thought. Sometimes the thought is, I'm just gonna look at Facebook quick. I want to check my email at 11.30 at night. Like, you don't need to check your email at 11.30 at night. But it's that thought of like, maybe I'll just look once. That's the thought. The next step is the chemical response. Our body reacts, right? The body starts preparing itself to get ready for action, and then the body does prepare itself. You have that, that, the body language. That body language can be every, everything from heightened heart rate to sweaty palms to whatever the thing is. Then you have the second thought. And the second thought, Dr. Skinner, taught, he calls it the battle. I call it the butt. Just one T. But Dr. Skinner calls it the battle because he says in this moment, it's when you actually go like, wait, 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 do I really want this or do I not want this? The battle is where you say, I could check this, but I shouldn't. The battle is where it's like, okay, I could just look, but you know, ha, I want to be a good person. I could look, but like, oh, it's Monday. I, couldn't go to, I can't get to confession until Saturday. Like, but there's the battle, and then finally there's the behavior. Now, for most people, if you have this, this experience, you know what all these steps are. Hopefully these seven steps, if you've been in this enough time where you look at porn, masturbation, that kind of thing, like this is not unfamiliar to you. Maybe you're just coming across it for the first time. Dr. Skinner says that once you get to number six, once you get to that second thought, the battle, if you haven't already like, engaged with the battle, your chances of winning are 50-50. If 
but I want to offer to you the opportunity to actually turn the car around earlier. If this is the superhighway, you actually have the opportunity to turn the car around earlier. So let's look at triggers. There can be triggers like um, this pop-up happens, this email or this, this uh, internet site happens. My invitation to everyone here, whether you struggle with this or not, is take this step, purify your environment. To purify your environment is absolutely essential for anyone who wants freedom. So the gal who, is, who gave her testimony, one of the things she had to do is she had to purify her environment. What are my triggers? What are the people, places, and things that I have in my life that can lead me down this road that I know I don't want to go down? Now, if you get to step six, right, the second thought, the battle, the battle might be over. But if you can turn around, around earlier by saying, actually, I don't have access, you're actually setting yourself up for success. Because what makes the internet so powerful? It's actually called, they call it the three A's. Three A's that make internet porn so powerful are it's accessible. It is in your pocket right now. It is anonymous. So far, no one can find out. And it's affordable. You can get it for free or for really cheap. Now, if you can take one of those A's or maybe even two of those A's away, then all of a sudden you're a huge leap forward to success and a huge leap forward to freedom. So how about this? Take away accessibility. Take away accessibility by purifying your environment. There is this, this uh, program. How many here, people here have heard of Covenant Eyes? Awesome, yeah. You have this, Covenant Eyes is so good. No, there, there's other internet filters which are, can be really helpful, but if you're good with computers, you know how to get around cov uh, internet filters. Covenant Eyes is awesome because what it is is not just a filter, it's actually an accountability program that it monitors your computer and all your devices. And what happens is you select ahead of time an accountability partner. And every day or every three or every seven days, you set it for every day, every three days or every seven days, your accountability partner gets an email saying, this is where you have been in the last day, three days or seven days. And if there's been any questionable sites, they get an alert right away. You know, some of you are like, seriously, people do that? <laughs> yes, they do. In fact, as a college campus chaplain, I, I'm the accountability partner. Imagine this, your, the email going to your priest saying, like, here's where John has been. Here's where Jackie has been. Here's where Jane has been. But I'm the accountability partner because why? They're, they say, for me, I need to purify my environment. You know, when Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He wasn't speaking literally, but he was speaking powerfully. And it, basically, if Jesus was living right now, he would say, if your iPhone's causing you to sin, get rid of it. If your laptop is causing you to sin, smash it. But you don't have to do that. You can actually get covenant eyes, and you can get rid of the access. Here's my invitation, so powerful invitation. I need you all to be patient with yourself, because this is not going to happen immediately, right? You can't just be free of this immediately. Be patient with yourself, but I, I beg you, be ruthless with your environment. Be patient with yourself, but ruthless with your environment. Because if I compromise, I'm dead. If I say, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I don't need that kind of step. You might be right. Again, I have the, I've had this conversation with so many men, with so many women. They're saying, like, Father, it was so crazy. Like, I, I know you told me to get covenant eyes. I didn't get it because I thought I was fine. And I was fine. I was fine for, like, like nine days in a row. Here's what happened. After nine days comes the what day? The tenth day. You guys, good job, front row. That's smart. After nine days comes the tenth day. And it was the tenth day I was feeling weak. The tenth day I got past step three and to step four. I got to step seven and my behavior led me down this road. Why? Because I was not ruthless with my environment. You guys, be patient with yourself, but ruthless with your environment. Whatever access you have to porn, just cut it off. You don't need it. it. Only makes you stupid, makes you a slave, makes you an accomplice. Step one, purify your environment. Step two, know yourself. Um, how many have heard of a guy named Sun Tzu? Sun Tzu was a Chinese general. He wrote the book called The Art of War. Here's what Sun Tzu said. It's just it's such a BA kind of a statement. He says, if you know, it, that means beyond awesome. Um, he says, if, if you know your enemy and yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. You know your enemy, you know yourself, you're going to win. 
But if you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer defeat. Maybe you might win, but you're also going to lose. But if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Y'all, we need to purify our environment, but we also need to know ourselves. What are the times when you're weakest? I want you to remember this acronym. The acronym is BLAST, and it stands for bored, lonely, angry, stressed, or tired. One of the things I find with so many people is if they understand this acronym about themselves, that they know themselves, they say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to porn right now, and they just stop, pump the brakes a little bit, and say, wait, 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 why? Oh, because I'm tired. Okay, news, go to bed. <laughs> I'm drawn to porn. I just have to do it. No, no, no. Why? What's going on inside of you? Well, actually, I'm just really stressed out. Okay. Or I'm really sad. S can be stressed or it can be sad. Okay, well, then, then you need to talk to someone about how stressed you are. You need to do something about how sad you are. So many people turn to porn because they're lonely. I don't, know you, I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever like, found yourself eating really, really late at night or any time of the day? You're eating, and you're like, what am I hungry for? I can't tell. So you just go to the fridge and just try everything. And all of a sudden, at one point, you realize, wait a second, I'm not hungry. I'm thirsty. Like, oh, I could have just had a glass of water. Instead, I went and did all this, looking for water in all the wrong places. I'm looking for love or the answer to boredom, loneliness, anger, stress, outness or tiredness in all the wrong places. So to know yourself. Yeah, when I get bored, I don't know what to do with myself, and so I just look to porn. Okay, well then, how about having a plan? What are you going to do when you get bored? And to realize, that's, I don't need this. I'm just angry right now. And I need to reach out. So to know yourself, to purify environment, and to know yourself with this, with this acronym BLAST. To do this would be to be able to get off the superhighway so much faster, so much quicker, and with so much more ease. Because again, no temptation has overcome you, has come against you, that is not common to all human beings. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But here's the thing. If I'm not willing to purify my, my environment, if I'm not willing to be ruthless with my environment, and I say, where was God? He didn't help me out. Well, listen, you got to do your part. With them, temptation will also provide a way of escape that you can endure it. To purify your environment and to know yourself. But to do this with ease, again, Sun Tzu, my last Sun Tzu quote, you can say, well, tell what I've been reading this summer. <laughs> to, to win 100 victories and 100 battles is not the acme or the epitome of skill. You think that would be it, right? To go into 100 battles and win 100 times? He says, no, no, no. To subdue the enemy without fighting, that's the epitome of skill. To actually win the battle without fighting is the epitome of skill. So how can you and I actually beat the temptation without having the fight? Well, St. Peter says this. I also read the Bible sometimes. St. Peter says, St. Peter says, okay, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded, be watchful. You know, listen, I'll talk to so many people who say their trigger is they have, when I'm talking to my college students who are over 21, it's like, Father, you know, I had two beers, and then I knew I shouldn't have that third one, but I did anyways. And then, went, then I went home and looked at porn. Like, oh, okay, so now you know. When St. Peter said be sober-minded, he also meant be sober <laughs> Be watchful, because your adversary prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him solid in your faith. What's one way you can do that? I say take physical action. We say purify your environment. Yep, know yourself. Yep. At some point, here's my invitation. You're at your computer or wherever you are. Maybe you purify, purify your environment, but you're tempted going on that road. My invitation is to make the sign of the cross. Whether that's a little small sign of the cross on your forehead or like the big old body sign of the cross. Because why? A couple of reasons. Here's what St. Cyril of Jerusalem said. This is way centuries and centuries ago. He said, let us therefore not be ashamed of the cross of Christ. Making the sign of the cross. He says, though others might hide it, you 
openly seal it upon your forehead, that the devil may behold the royal sign and flee trembling away. Make this sign when you're eating and drinking, when you're sitting, when you're lying down, when you're rising up, when you're speaking, when you're walking, in a word, when you're looking on the internet, like at, with every act. Here's my invitation. Because I'll tell my students, especially those who are tempted towards porn or those who are tempted towards other kinds of impurity with other people, say this guy and this girl are dating, and they're like, Father, we keep falling into sin with each other. I'm like, you guys, make the sign of the cross. When you're in, tempted, make the sign of the cross. Because there's nothing that can kill the mood more than like, hold on a second. What was that for? Because uh, I was getting kind of ramped up. I got to cool down. <laughs> Honestly, you guys, uh, imagine next time you're, you're tempted, you're online, and you haven't purified your environment because you didn't listen to me. You should. But, and you, you want to click to the next link, but instead you make the sign of the cross, and then try clicking right after that. You click, make the sign of the cross again. Click, sign of the cross again. See how long that goes. It will stop, not only because the devil flees at the sign of the cross, but also because you literally can't masturbate while you're making the sign of the cross. <laughs> and also, you're making a physical, <laughs> you're making the physical decision, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. And you cannot, you cannot belong to Jesus and sa Satan at the same time. Now at the same time, here's the thing. <laughs> you guys... <laughs> We're just going to move on. It's true. You know it's true. <laughs> you might still find yourself a little bit ground down by this temptation and, sing, and think like, at the same time, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Well, John Paul II, St. John Paul the Great, he once said, there are three infallible and indispensable means of holiness. I want to highlight this because this is very important. Three infallible, meaning they cannot fail, and indispensable meaning you cannot win without them. Three infallible and indispensable means of holiness. Number one, he says, is prayer. If you wrestle with porn, wrestle with masturbation, and you say, I'm just so deep in it, I can't, I can't get out of this. Well, here's a quote. Serious sin and serious prayer cannot coexist. One will kill the other. And if you say, no, I want to belong to Jesus, but I struggle with his weakness, I'd say, just don't give up praying. I'm not saying it'll kill it today, but I promise you, whether that's in a year or in 10 years or in three decades, I promise you, serious sin and serious prayer cannot coexist. One will kill the other. Which one do you want to win? That's the one that will win. Say a faithful prayer, indispensable, infallible means of holiness. Number two, confession is the second infallible and indispensable means of holiness. But I know one of the, one of the biggest things... Um, how many people here have ever watched the TV show 24? Okay, it's kind of older now, but, but what would happen is, here's Jack Bauer, and he's part of the counterterrorism unit, and what would happen every single season was there's some kind of terrorist who would show up, and they do all these crazy terrorizing things around the city. And so at some point in the middle of the season, you know, there's this person who's hostage over here, there's a bomb going off over here, there's another crisis over here. At one point in the season, Jack Bauer would stop and say, ask one question. And that one question was, okay, wait, wait, What's the terrorist's end game? Like, what do they really want? Yes, there's someone who's kidnapped. Yes, there's a bomb over here. Yes, there's another crisis here. But what is it they really want? And when we are facing Satan, because that's really what it comes down to, Ephesians 6 says this, our battle is not with flesh and blood. Our battle is with the principalities, the powers, the world rulers of this present darkness. What is Satan's end game for you? I got, I got news for you. Satan's end game is not to just to get you to masturbate. <laughs> Satan doesn't just want you to fall in purity. Satan doesn't just want you to look at porn. Satan's end game is to get you to the point where you have struggled and failed with your weakness for so long that you just end up discouraged. That's what he wants. Because virtually every person in this room right now, you know the truth. You know that Jesus is God. You know that he loves you. You know that confession works every single time. But if Satan can get you to the point where you are so simply discouraged by your weakness that you quit, that's the only way he can win. I want to say that again. For those of you who know the truth about Jesus Christ, 
the only way Satan will ever win in your life is if he gets you to the point where you're so discouraged that you just give up. So you know the real battle in your life. It's not going to be purity alone. It's going to be discouragement. So we need prayer, we need confession, and we also need the Eucharist. Jesus in the Eucharist. For many reasons, but here's one. Um, because uh, when it comes down to it, this isn't just about behavior modification, right? This isn't just about like, hey, stay away from the bad stuff and, and just really white knuckle it, like hold on to the steering wheel as hard as you can and just maybe you'll make it to the end. This is about changing our desires. This is about changing what we love. And the more and more we go back to the Eucharist, the more and more our hearts become more and more in love with Jesus. I can, I, I can struggle and I can say like, no, I'm just going to stay away from this. But if all my life is, is staying away from something but not running towards something, that's not a life. That's not living. But if we get close to the Eucharist, what will happen is this. Your heart will become like his heart. That you'll learn to love what he loves. You'll learn to desire what Jesus desires. And yes, you will learn to hate what Jesus hates. And Jesus hates porn. Because it makes you stupid. It makes you a slave and it makes you an accomplice. But if you turn to the Eucharist, what happens is it changes our hearts. Um, there was a... Uh, there was a rat experiment. They experiment with rats a lot. Um, here's a kind of second to last thing. Um, they experiment with rats a lot. And at one point back in the 50s, they, they put these rats in, um, if when it comes to dopamine, I skipped that slide earlier. When it comes to dopamine, they actually hooked these neurological triggers to these rats' brains, to the pleasure center of the rats' brains. And if the rats would hit a lever, it would trigger that ple pleasure center. And they found that these rats would hit the ple that, that, tri that lever up to 7,000 times in an hour. Just they wanted the shot. They wanted the shot. There was actually cases of rats who would hit the lever 2,000 times an hour for over 24 hours around the clock. They wouldn't eat. They wouldn't drink. They wouldn't socialize. They, they didn't want anything else other than the pleasure. And this is described some people's life with porn. But there's this guy. These two guys, James Olds and, and Peter Milner, in the 50s, they put this rat by himself in a cage and offered him food and water and drugs that triggered dropamine. And they found that these, this, this rat in this solitary confinement, basically, would choose drugs over food and water. And they said, yeah, because if you get addicted, you're, you're stuck, you're done. Now, there was a guy, his name's Bruce Alexander, he said, well, that's interesting But there's a unique thing about those rats in those cages. They didn't have any other rats with them. And so what he did is he set up a thing called Rat Park. And in Rat Park, he had the drugs, but he also had food. He also had like things that rats could play with. He also had other rats. And he found that when he put the rats together in Rat Park, where there were things for them to do, where there was food for them to eat, where there were other rats for them to interact with, none of them wanted the drugs that, well, maybe they didn't get hooked on it. So what they did is they put these rats in individual solitary confinement cages for up to 57 days by themselves, let them get addicted to the drugs, and then introduce them to Rat Park. Thinking like, no, no, they're going to be addicts in Rat Park. But the moment they were in, interaction with, in, in contact with other people, other rats, and the moment they were in social, a social situation, the moment they had other opportunities, what did they do? They left the drugs, and they went to the community. So many people turn to porn because they're just alone, isolated, by themselves, and lonely. But you're not made to be lonely. In our culture right now, th these statistics are out there. We have fewer friends and more floor space than ever before. We have bigger homes, but less people who really know us and love us. So what's one of the things we need to do? Again, yes, purify your environment. Absolutely. Yes, know yourself completely. Yes, make the sign of the cross when you're tempted. Uh-huh. But also, go into not rat park. Go to human park. Like, to seek out accountability, but to also to seek out friends. 
be, you guys, brothers and sisters, please be patient with yourself and ruthless with your environment. And if there's anything, anything, anything I can recommend, it's to know that Satan's goal is not to get you to look at something. Satan's goal is not to get you to fall. Satan's goal is to get you discouraged. So my, my plea, my plea is don't quit ever, ever, ever. My friend uh, Mark Hart, he's made this thing called the Victory App, and I just want to let him tell you a little bit about that in this video. One of the hardest parts about being a youth minister for me is when a teen or young adult comes to me and says, Mark, I really want to change this part of my life, but I don't know how. I want to break free from, from pornography, from sexual sin, from temptation, whatever, but I don't know how. What do I do next? And that's why a couple years ago, I got together with my good friend Matt Frad and our team at Life Teen, and we created something new called the Victory App. It's available on Android or iPhone. You can download it for free. And in the Victory app, you'll find readings and writings that will help you to go deeper in your prayer life, help you to overcome these temptations, to resist them. You're going to find daily trackers and, and, and elements that will help you see where you're most likely, when you're most likely to fall into this, to, to, to seek it out. So you can start to learn about yourself, what these triggers are, and help your soul lead your body instead of vice versa. There's even a built-in piece on the app where if your friend downloads it, also, again, for free, you can press one button and send a prayer request, a push notification right to your friend's phone. You know, I need help right now. I need prayer right now. That's what it'll say. Totally anonymous, but, but totally legit. This is the kind of accountability that you're going to need to move forward. The kind of friends and accountability you're going to need to finally be victorious in this battle. But that's not all. That we at Life Teen and the Youth Outreach Office at Franciscan University of Steubenville, we got together and we said, what else can we give all these young people this summer. And that's why we created a new website, leaveporn.com. And if you go there, you'll be able to find the Victory app, but you'll also find a ton of videos and blogs, things that will help you in your daily walk as you move forward from this conference weekend. We are with you, we are behind you, and we believe in you. You can be victorious in this battle. Do not give in. Strive for holiness. God bless you. See y'all. Leaveporn.com, leaveporn.com, as well as the Victory app. There are people at the doorways, I believe, they have little cards for y'all. And I want to invite you to take one of those cards on your way out, or before you leave this room, leave this space, and download the Victory app, get the card and that prayer card to be able to actually say, I'm going to engage this battle. I'm not going to be a casualty of this. The world is trying to, the devil is trying to steal my soul through this vehicle, and he is not going to win in my life. Let's pray in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we give you praise and glory. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Almighty, my, Almighty God, bless you all. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>